Hello, I'm your host, James Dorsey. Please subscribe to my newsletter and or YouTube channel where you can click the notification button for more updates. Also, allow me to thank all who have demonstrated their appreciation for my column by becoming paid subscribers. This enables me to ensure that it continues to have maximum impact. Maintaining free distribution means that news websites, blogs, and newsletters across the globe can republish it. If you are able and willing to support the column, please become a paid subscriber by clicking on Substack on the subscription button at www.jamesmdorsey.substack.com and choosing one of the subscription options. Thank you. Take care and best wishes. France defeated Morocco 2-0 on the pitch. But off the pitch, Morocco is up 4-0. Ultimately, the effects of Morocco's off-the-pitch success may ripple much longer than the fallout of its stellar performance in the stadium. To be sure, Morocco shares its off-the-pitch success with others, including France, its on-the-pitch history-laden rival, as well as Qatar and Qatari activists. Fielding squads populated to large degrees by immigrants and their descendants, Morocco and France put migration in a different light at a time when Europe struggled to control immigration. Migration helped make both teams what they are, one of the world's top four soccer squads. The symbolism was not lost on the day four people died when a boat carrying dozens of would-be migrants from France to Britain capsized in the English Channel. The incident boosted calls for policies that offer migrants safe and legal pathways, rather than focus primarily on law enforcement and border protection. Imagine that France and Morocco had dueled four days later on December 18, International Migrants Day, and the day of France's World Cup final against Argentina. The symbolism would have been even starker. Even so, the Morocco-France match added texture to the identity aspect of the migration debate and the symbolism of Morocco's on and off the pitch performance. Many Moroccans and non-Moroccans took pride and joy in the North African state's Cinderella-like march through the tournament against the backdrop of colonial history, decades of Islam having been put post 9-11 on the defensive amid rising Islamophobia, and as an expression of the rebalancing of global power between West and East. Morocco's semi-final pairing with France has taken an outsized geopolitical dimension, seemingly pitting the once colonized against its former colonizer. The global south taking on the global north, east against west, David versus Goliath, said Paul Silverstein, an anthropologist focused on North Africa. On one level, the support of a predominantly Muslim, Arab and African nation constituted a rejection of militant, politically violent expressions of Islam that sought to exploit the World Cup to divide rather than bring people together in a fleeting moment of solidarity. An Islamic State poster accusing Jews and Christians of using sports to distract Muslims from waging jihad failed to resonate with fans in Doha and elsewhere. Sports scholar Mahmoud Amara and political scientist Yusuf Buandel noted that even the most radical and conservative wings in Islam have not been successful in distancing these populations with their quasi-religious passion for football, which for many is one of the few sources of entertainment when confronted with daily socioeconomic difficulties. Likewise, the empathy with Morocco's sporting success 
and spotlighting of the Palestinian cause, fueled rather than resolved debates about Moroccan identity, visible gaps between Arab elites and publics, and rivalries among Gulf states that continued to play out despite an end to open animosity. Little noticed in the celebration of the Moroccan feat as an Arab and African success was Moroccan goalkeeper Munir Mohamed El Kajoui's gesture when he put his Amazic identity on public display by wrapping the ethnic group's tricolor around his waist during celebrations after Morocco defeated Spain. Amazigs or Berbers who account for 40% of the Moroccan population saw their identity buried under the Arab African label. To assert themselves, Amazig celebrated Mr. al Kajoui's gesture on social media, prompting discussion about whether Morocco is an Arab country. The complexity of the identity issue at times sparked confusion. In one incident, in a twist of irony, Guthrie security prevented fans from bringing the blue, green, and yellow Amazigh tricolor into the stadium in the mistaken belief that it represented the LGBTQ rainbow. In another, Moroccan striker Hakim Ziyech listened impatiently drumming his fingers as a journalist asked questions in Arabic. A speaker of Dutch, English, and Tarfit, a Berber language, Mr. Ziyech responded, now in English, please. Most Moroccans speak Darija, a spoken rather than a written language, widely classified as an Arabic dialect that most Arabic speakers beyond the Maghreb, the Western part of North Africa that also includes Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, and Tunisia are unable to understand. As a result, Bein, the Gadri sports broadcaster, adds Arabic subtitles when it broadcasts interviews with Darija speaking Moroccan players and fans. As genuine as World Cup fans' support of the Palestinians was, the emergence of Palestine as a touchstone for the gap between elites and public opinion constituted a throwback to the days when Palestinians were a lightning rod for widespread frustration with non-performing autocratic Arab regimes. In a subtle or perhaps not so subtle way, Palestine served Qatar's purpose. It allowed Qatar to point the finger at its Gulf rivals, particularly the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. These two Arab states were at the forefront of the three and a half year long UAE Saudi led economic and diplomatic boycott of the Gulf state that was lifted in early 2021. And they recognized Israel in 2020. To be sure, the subtext of animosity encountered by Israelis in Gaza was a far cry from the call on Muslims by the Islamic state to cut the necks of Christians and Jews and kick their heads through the battlefields, rather than surrender your heads to be played within the soccer arenas. Implicitly, fans were taking to task those governments that had recognized Israel for failing to link normalization to resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In doing so, the fans unwittingly projected Qatar as a more open society. They further positioned the Gulf state as being on the right side of history by refusing to normalize relations with Israel before the Jewish state engaged in a constructive solution to the Palestinian problem. Qatari tolerance of public support for the Palestinians contrasted starkly with the UAE's banning of critics from travel and restrictions on expressing pro-Palestinian sentiment in Bahrain. Emphasis on the Palestinians allowed Qatar to portray itself as a country that enables civil society, albeit only if groups align themselves with the Gulf state's policies and only 
when the timing of their activities suits the government. One group that played a key role in galvanizing fan support for the Palestinians, Gata Youth Opposed to Normalization, or Kayon, discovered that early on, as the government sought to bend the group to its will through coercion and intimidation. Founded in 2011, at the time of Guthrie's support for popular revolts in the region, Kayon saw in the World Cup an opportunity to bolster its campaign against engaging with Israel. The government rejected the group's initial World Cup-related demand that it bars Israelis from attending the tournament in violation of the rules of world soccer body FIFA. FIFA obliges host countries to allow fans to attend the World Cup irrespective of whether they are from nations the tournament does not recognize or is at odds with the host country. Nevertheless, in contrast to spectators whom Gadri security prevented from wearing to matches one love armbands favoring LGBTQ rights, a sensitive issue in Gata, or paraphernalia and support of anti-government protesters in Iran, authorities did nothing to stop Kayon from galvanizing fans attending the World Cup. Gata justified its banning of the One Love armband and anti-Iranian paraphernalia by pointing to FIFA's ban on all political expression on the pitch. It's unclear whether FIFA extended the ban to the pro-Palestine campaign or whether Gata chose to ignore the FIFA rule selectively. In the final analysis, Gata, unlike Morocco, never made it out of the World Cup's group stage. But like Morocco, it emerges from the World Cup an official off-the-pitch winner. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Also, thank you to all who have demonstrated their appreciation for my column by becoming paid subscribers. This allows me to ensure that it continues to have maximum impact. Maintaining free distribution means that news websites, blogs, and newsletters across the globe can republish it. If you are able and willing to support the column, please become a paid subscriber by clicking on Substack on the subscription button at www.jamesmdorsey.substack.com and choosing one of the subscription options. Please join me for my next podcast in the coming days. Thank you. Take care and best wishes. Thank you.